we talk about all uh, the three types of the membrane electrode, all right? So now, how can you use this electrode for quantitative analysis? So that's the last uh, portion of the, this chapter, last, last section of this chapter. Uh, I show you something here that you, 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 you don't need to do any math here, but just follow me. So uh, last, in last example, we ignore the junction potential, but here we kind of put it again. So what I want to show you here is that you cannot really like find the ion concentration theoretically from, from the Nunn's equation and or membrane potential equation. For example, here, you, can, you know that you can measure E cell, right? You can measure E cell. And you prepare the solution with the known concentration, or maybe you can you don't know it. E cell now is equal to the E indicator minus E reference and plus junction potential. And the E indicator here is gonna be E membrane plus the internal reference and minus the ex the outer reference, which is the our family reference here, plus E junction. But every term we always assume that they are constant like we did in the last example. So we kind of combine this to be constant and you can, at the end, we usually <clears throat> assume that <clears throat> all the membrane uh, electrode potential gonna have this uh, term, which is E cell equal to constant minus 0.0592 over charge and multiplied by the P ion. But, and then you can rearrange this as well and get this. And you have the constant. So now in theory, if you, if you, did, if you measure the E cell of the solution, and then you know the charge of, of the ion, you know the constant here, like you know the reference potential here, and in theory, you can find the PI here. But that's the, the theory. In real life, they, is it really constant? Are they really constant? Or is there, are there any other terms that you may not know? Of course, there is. Like junction potential, you cannot like, quantita quantitatively find it. So in real life, we cannot do, uh, calculate the concentration from the theory. In real life, we need, just, we need to just uh, do the calibration between the P ion and the E cell. This is similar to uh, this one. This is basically this one, right? When we want to uh, calibrate the pH meter by the several concent uh, standards of the buffer. So this is what, what I want to show you here is that to do the potential metric, you need to do calibration. You, know, you need to have the series of the known ion concentration and you need to uh, measure the E cell from each solution and you construct the calibration curve and then use that calibration curve to do the quantitative analysis. And this is, again, this is the example just to summarize uh, in the shorter term. When we talk about pH, uh, usually we, in theory, we talk, we, we, we did, uh, define the pH as the negative uh, base 10 logarithm of the con concentration of proton or activity of the proton. But this is actually very hard to find in reality in fr uh, from the experiment. So we have something called operational definition instead, which we find the pH from the calibration. This is a bunch of equation, but the, the main concept is that you just need the calibration. You cannot find it from theory, that's it. So that's, uh, that's one uh, point when you want to do the quantitative analysis using potentiometry. The next point is that uh, how you can actually do it. Here, yeah, so, uh, so let's uh, consider this figure first, this figure first. So we prepare a series of ion concentration, like maybe 10 to the negative seven, 10 to the negative six, 10 to the negative five, four, and three. This is because uh, we actually plot it against the PI, right? The negative log concentration and 
if we want it to be linear, then this is going to have to be a uh, vary something like this. It's going to be linear in the exponent. Exponents. So that's how, how you prepare the calibration solution. But now the problem is also, we always assume that the activity is equal to the concentration. We always assume that activity is always equal to the concentration and the membrane potential like I operate like that, the concentrate the activity. But you can see here that the range of the solution that we are working here is uh, very huge. We expand a lot of concentration, like from the 10 to the negative seven to the 10 to the negative three, which is what uh, 0.1 micromolar to one millimolar, right? Which is very, this is very huge. And these difference in concentration actually give, uh, give them the very different activity coefficient. And if you plot, if you just prepare the concentration like this and measure the E cell or E membrane, you're gonna get, you're gonna get the dashed line here. You're gonna get the dashed line here, which is not that straight. The line, this line is not actually straight line. It is a little bit curved. This is because the activity coefficient is different between these different ion concentration solution. So that's why you don't really get the real linearity. So one way to prevent this when you do the potentiometry is that we prepare the standard solution in something called total ionic strength adjustment buffer. Total ionic strength adjustment buffer or uh, TISAB or we can call it TISAB. TISAB. This TISAB is the high concentrated electrolyte or salt, which can uh, basically make the activity efficient in every solution here to be the same. To be the same, so that you maintain the linearity here as the, uh, the bow line here. If you don't put the tie sap, you're going to get the dash line so that if you put it, it's going to be better like this one. So this is the way to keep the activity coefficient constant. And I think if you, if you have the chance to take the GRE chemistry or anything, so this is kind of important. Yeah. So the first. So again, the first step to do potentiometry is that you prepare the series of standard solution, but they have to be in the tie step. The second step is that you measure the E cell or the indicator electrode potential or cell potential of each standard, and then you plot the calibration curve. And then once you get the calibration curve, you do the same thing, the, the same sample preparation with your sample, and then measure the E cell and plug the E cell in the calibration curve equation. So to illustrate uh, my point here, let's do the, the last example here. I think the last example here. So the last example here uh, tell you that when a fluoride electrode was immersed in the standard solution, which is the fluoride in 0.1 molar sodium nitrate, the following potential against uh, calomino electrode was obtained. This one. Calculate fluoride in an unknown that give the potential of zero millivolt. So basically this point one uh, this point one molar sodium nitrate is the is our high step. The concentration is very high compared to the concentration of analyte here. Your analyte is fluoride, right? And this is from like 10 to the negative five to the 10 to the negative three. And this is point one. So this is your tie step. So now the uh, data is given here is that when you vary the con concentration of fluoride and measure the E cell, and you get this. So can you calculate the fluoride if your unknown give this give the E E value to be zero point zero? So what is it? So uh, how to do this? Because we know that the linearity is the E against uh lock of the ion, right? Or E against uh, P fluoride. 
but this one gonna have the negative sign. So uh, I'm just gonna show you uh, the curve here. So in this example, they put the E and then the, that X axis gonna be the log of the fluoride concentration. So you base, so the log of the one to uh, multiply by 10 to the five, 10 to the minus five is minus five, right? And, you, and then this is my, uh, 100, so you plot 100 here. For the second solution, this is 10 to the minus four. So uh, the logarithm of that is minus four, and then you plot it here. And then this is the minus three. And your unknown, your unknown give the E electro E potential of zero. So basically this one, right? This one, zero. So you can plug zero in this calibration equation that they give. And then, so you are slow right concentration in your unknown going to be around this. So you, we can just plug it, right? So 0, 0 0.0 is equal to minus 58.5 uh, log fluoride minus 192.5. This is given. You, or you can use Excel to find this as, as well. And then you can solve and then the fluoride is 5.1 meter power 10 to the negative 4 molar, which is around here. So our math should be right here. So this is the theory where how to do the potentiometry. Any question on this one? Um, just one question. Mm -hmm. So this one has a negative slope. Apparently. Yeah, I... yeah, because because this one is log, right? But uh, when we talk about in previously, this is uh, p, right? Yes. And and p fluoride is actually minus log fluoride, right? So if you decide to plot against the p f and E, now you're gonna get the positive slope. And you can do both, you can do both. The example that I got in here, they use lock, but if you do it by yourself, you can do P, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, move on. So this is, all of this is on the assumption that your electrode only responds to one kind of ion. So on the next page, so in real life, maybe your electrode responds to several kinds of ion. Several kinds of ion. Like when we talk about glass membrane electrode, it may respond with the sodium, right? In addition to the proton. So the sodium, we call it the interference of the analysis. And there are some way to quantify the interference of those ions. We use something called potentiometric selectivity coefficient. Potentiometric selectivity coefficient, or this term, is going to be K uh, and I, comma J, and POT is potentiometry. That's fine. I, J. I is your analyte, and J is your interference. For, exa for example, when we talk about the glass membrane electrode, your proton is the analyte, right? But if we, if we want to quantify the interference effect of sodium, then we're going to have to find the here proton sodium potentiometry. But uh, at this level, you don't need to know how to find it, but you need to know how to use it. So like in the exam or in the exercise, maybe I will give you this mm -hmm. one. I will give you the K of each ion and then uh, I'm going to ask you, like, for example, if we want to measure for pH 5 solution with glass membrane electrode, but it has sodium of 0.1 molar, let's say, and this coefficient of sodium is something like maybe 0.05, then can you calculate this? I think, yeah, this is all, this is in the chapter exercise as well. You can uh, practice using it. <clears throat> So
So uh, originally you have only this one, right? You have only only this one, but now you're gonna have uh, this one as well when you have interference. Or if we want to write it in the twenty five degrees Celsius form, this gonna be uh, let me go to this one. This gonna be E is equal to constant uh, plus point oh five nine two over Z I log base 10 activity or concentration of the analyte ion plus uh, this one so we have the sigma because we if there are more than one interference you're gonna have to do this you're gonna have to sum everything but if you have one kind of ion, this and ZJ over ZI, assume that your interference and your ion has different charge. But if, I, if I, I'm going to write the exam question, I'm going to just give you one kind of ion and one kind of charge. So you can use uh, this one. So you can use this one. So it's going to be con some constant plus 0.0592 over ZI log base 10 of the concentration of ion ion concentration plus k that k and then multiply by the concentration of interference let's use j okay j is interference something like this so this is the approximate from at 20 uh, at 25 degrees celsius and assume one interference one interference and assume same charge All right. So uh, let's do the last slide here, and then we can we can end the class, the content of the class. Uh, one way to do potentiometry for analytical chemistry is to construct the calibration curve like that. Like that, you prepare the series of concentration of solution and then measure the, the cell potential or membrane potential. Another way to apply the potentiometry is you do something called potentiometric titration. So if you think about the titration last time, last year, or when you was in high school, when you were in high school, you, you prepare, you uh, put the indicator, right? Like phenolphthalein, you put the phenolphthalein in the flask and then you perform the titration and you, uh, uh, detect the change of the indicator color and call it the end part. But that may be more difficult if you use the diluted solution or if your sample solution has color. So instead, in, instead of using the, the acid-based indicator, we can use the pH meter or your pH electrode to do the titration instead. So instead of putting the indicator, we can just put the pH meter here, you can see. And then you plot, you do the titration, same thing again. And then you plot the pH that you can read or the p-ion that you can read against the volume of the titrant. Here, for example, if you want to analyze the acid, then you put the base, right, as your titrant. This is sodium hydroxide titrant. And then you plot the pH that you can read against the volume of the sodium hydroxide. And then you can analyze, analyze the titration curve which i'm not gonna tell uh, teach you in this class because next semester you will do it so let's wait until next semester on how to do that all right and there are many like advantage to you to do this of course because if your sample has color then you cannot use indicator you, you just have to use the ph meter and when you use machines something like this you can buy you can purchase the auto titrator the auto titrator, which can do this without human, and it can detect the endpoint or the equivalent point by itself.